Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to episode 50 of the Coffee Squad podcast. Today, we are continuing our home technical security. This is part two, uh, taking care of yourself using technology. We got Cliff on again, so thanks a lot, Cliff, uh, for joining us a second time this week. Uh, for those of you who didn't listen last week and are just joining us, Cliff is a cybersecurity consultant uh, specializing in credential theft and cloud security. He's done work that isolates identity, and now he is focusing more on cloud security. So uh, Cliff is a lot smarter than us. He's also like a CrossFit guru. He's just a good dude all around. Um, so Cliff, thanks for joining us. Um, did we miss anything about you? Anything special um, our listeners and viewers should know about you? Pretty much covers it. Happy to be here. Cool. Cool, cool. Yeah, thanks for coming back. For those that didn't uh, catch up last week's episode, we covered uh, kind of how to secure your home network with Cliff. He was nice enough to come on, and he decided to join us again. God bless him. Uh, we talked about securing our routers, our Wi-Fi networks, our computer settings, how to set up guest networks and use them, stuff like that. So make sure you brush up on that. That's always good information. And uh, so let's get started with this week's episode, Jay. Hey, what are you paying, Cliff, Will? I mean, are you paying him like coffee beans, coffee bags? What are we talking, like instant coffee? I mean... You, you'll find out like soon enough, Jake. Yeah, you'll, you'll find out soon enough, Jake. We got something that works for you. Oh, you do, huh? Yeah. I me, like me and Cliff have been working it out. You'll you'll find out soon enough. I hope, I hope Cliff, you're not like, going to hack my computer or something. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Might be too late. Oh. Yeah, I already had well, somebody uh, comment on uh, on our YouTube channel that they uh, they know your passwords, Jake. So you might want to no. <laughs> check that out and uh, yeah. I'm check them out you, and uh, change them. I, I probably know who it is. It's my good buddy, Tim. Yep, um, that's but, who it yeah, was. <laughs> I've uh, grown up with him since I was like five. So I used to use literally my football number for every single thing. <laughs> Garage door opener, bank accounts, you name it. Um, I'm not going to say if I've changed it or not. Uh, I have. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Thanks for putting that out on the internet, man. Uh, he didn't say my, what it was. He just said he knew him. Yeah. Well, now I'm changing him. <laughs> that's cool. So... Uh, so cool. Well, the good thing, Cliff, is that you're still talking to me, you know, after you've already hacked my stuff, seen everything. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, obviously you didn't get that one little dark space that I have hidden. Don't worry about there. that ransomware that's coming down soon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Well, since you're drinking, what are you drinking today, man? <clears throat> All right. Yeah. You caught me in the middle of a swallow, but, uh, I am drinking one nation coffee. They're out of a uh, Charleston, South Carolina veteran and a uh, law enforcement owned coffee company. Uh, them drinking their Reveille, so it's a light roast breakfast blend made with Tanzanian pea berry bean. So yeah, that's good. And I have my trusty H two O, you know that good quality H two O. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. All right, go ahead. Um, what kind of vanilla chai latte spice whatever are you drinking this morning? I don't even have to say because you already said it for me, man. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I mean, look, no, I'm just drinking. Well, I guess right, a green better. screen with a green cup. I probably didn't plan that very well. Uh, I, I'm just drinking some uh, some like ketones uh, water this morning, so I'm dropping weight like crazy right now. I'm feeling good, so yeah, I'm, I'm picking it up. So. Pretty it's energized good. about that, yeah. So, Cliff, what are you drinking? I got some nice uh, black rifle coffee, uh, some light roast today. It's pretty good. Any any hints of flavor or anything like? Man, I was hoping this week, Cliff, you'd come on here and like just blow Will out of the water. Like, Will, you don't know anything. I got a coffee guy coming on in, in, in next month, and he'll probably he'll put me to shame. I won't know what I, I won't know anything compared to him. So you better study up, Will. I do. I need to start researching. So doing my open source stuff. And speaking of, let's kind of transition into today's episode, um, Cliff. I know you guys talk about PAI and PII. Uh, so what exactly is it? Yeah, so PAI, you got publicly accessible information, right? That's pretty much anything on the internet that's um, aggregated from stuff that you put on the internet any kind of way. You know, they have those big companies that will pretty much scour the internet and just put it all on a database. And, you know, they can get paid by people uh, to get information about you pretty much. So anything that you put out there, those people try to get. And then you have your PII, personally identifiable information. It's like, you know, sometimes when you go to the doctor and you put stuff on documents or, you know, credit cards, anything like that, that's supposed to be secured and used and only in their nature, um, that's going to be PII. Yeah. So theoretically, PII should be more secure than your PAI. 
It should be. Um, of course, there's all those data leaks all the time and yeah. stuff like that and compromises and people will get that information. And, you know, a lot of that information is for sale on the black market and the dark web these days. So it's out there, though. And so you can control kind of what your PAI is, but not as much as your PII. Is that kind of how I understand it? You can you can control what you put out there. Yeah, you can control a lot of the PAI and then really you just have to do your due diligence and do work with PII. Love that word, due diligence, right? Uh, I'm going to start getting a little like ringer and ding it every time somebody says it for Jake. You should, man. You should. You should get one of those. I don't know. Gets um, a, a, a green beret gets his beret every time you say due diligence. I like it. I like it. Don't <laughs> ring the bell though, man. Uh, no, that's a seal thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. That. yeah, that's yeah. quit. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, we're talking about PAI, PAI, PAI and PII. I know when we do our due diligence on the individuals and companies and everything else, that's what we look for, you know? So, I think a, a good way is anything that you put out there, like Cliff was saying, is accessible to anybody. So whenever you buy a home, uh, that's public mm -hmm. information. We can look at you know, where you bought it, what your lot size is, how much you paid for it. Uh, so much stuff when you buy a car, when you go to register that car, that's publicly um, available information. Um, and so uh, I know Cliff did a really good job last week talking about like emails and uh, creating like temporary spoof emails. That's a, a great way to protect your PAI uh, when you're just trying to log on or, you know, uh, buy certain things. I know mm -hmm. when I buy certain things that Cliff probably saw when he was hacking my my stuff, <laughs> you know, some some shady stuff. I always use your name, Will, and your address. Um, That's why I'm getting all those calls. I, I've been getting a bunch of calls about my uh, auto warranty going out and I haven't bought a new car since like 2009. So, you know, well, Hence, you need a new warranty, buddy. I mean, come on now. So, uh, and then PA, PII, you're, I constantly see and hear on the news of hospitals, I think, are, are some of the mm -hmm. biggest targets of uh, getting the PII um, leaked and hacked. Uh, and that information is on the dark web. And it's it's really, really interesting how easy sometimes it is for these hackers, you know, these smart hacker groups, whether they're large or small, some, you know, what we think of, you know, I don't know what to call the guy or. Anonymous. sitting in the basement, you know, 300 pounds, eating Cheetos, drinking Cokes all day long in Mountain Dew. Uh, but it's not that hard really for someone who's smart to get PAI, PII out. PAI, it's, it's easy. We, we do them in our due diligence reports all the time. Totally legal. There's nothing illegal about um, open source information yet. There's um, been a few court cases looking at it. Um, no, that's, and, that's in the U.S. though, right? Because certain countries have different laws, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah, the European Union, I think, has some of the most stringent. I don't know if you know this, Cliff, or can talk on that, but they have some of the most stringent cyber laws uh, that I've seen. And the U.S. is catching up, I think, uh, to it. So, yeah, it's kind of tough to catch up from that, though. There's so much out there, and you can never really change the past. You can only change what's moving forward when it comes to information, and it's kind of already planted. Well, yeah, I I think technology is moving so fast and advancing so fast that a lot of times not only humans, but even the security measures that are built into the technology, we don't have the time to kind of keep up with it. We're playing catch up as opposed to being pro uh, proactive and preventative. Exactly. Security is not the uh, main uh, front that it's building on, unfortunately. So Jake, this is going to kind of, you know, I, I know you're a legend in your own mind. So how do you protect yourself yeah, if right. you are a public figure? I just carry a Glock with me everywhere, man. <laughs> I mean, enough said, right? Let's move on. Um, I mean, let's, so there's a great book. I don't even have it with, I mean, it's literally sitting like right there. I'd have to take off my earbuds, but uh, Michael Basel, Basil, uh, I don't ever know how to say his uh, name. He was a, a U.S. Marshal and then did a lot of work for the FBI on their cyber crimes unit. And he's written a book. He does a podcast as well. Podcast is free. It's a, uh, Oh, Cliff, you and I were just talking about, I think it's OSINT is the title of it. O-S-I-N-T. Um, great, great book on how to protect yourself and, and hide yourself and your PAI information out there. So um, I, again, um, you, you have to, if you're a public figure and a high enough public figure, I would probably definitely put more stock into that and do a lot of those things. I'm just the average Joe. Um no one really knows who I am, what I am, um, and no one cares, right? Um, the, 
Well, this podcast just hasn't bumped up enough. So uh, <laughs> until that happens, man, um, I'm just pointing the finger at you is why I'm not famous. They they but, know that you're the one legged man in the ass kicking contest. Everybody knows that. So, but there's several of us out there, <laughs> but there's only one of these. Um, yeah, man. Uh, look at Michael Bazell, Basil, however you say his last name. Great. Listen to his podcast. Cliff, any, any tidbits you have? I, I guess like when we're talking like your PI, PII, when you get the mail, right? Credit card, whether it's a credit, a credit card statement, any financial statements you get, any credit card offers, really, I just shred all mail, you know, um, buy yourself a good shredder. And if you're super paranoid, shred it, burn it, douse it and whatever, you know, uh, but I think a very good shredder um, does the trick for, for the average person. Yeah. And before you get to the shredding part, honestly, I would try to switch the digital statements. Um, if you can, don't even leave a paper trail. If you have a digital statement, they can't really put statements in the emails anyways. It's going to say, go to our website and look at it here. So that kind of even prevents that. But like you said, shred it, burn it. Don't even let the information get out there if possible. Yeah. And then, you know, your cyber hygiene, we're going to talk more about that today with Cliff. Um, and I think that's why we started with PA, PAI and PII is really how to a good cyber hygiene. You know, we talked about emails and what to click, what not to click last week, but also you know, just putting yourself out there uh, limited. And if you can just put something that you work with that, you know, uh, like I do with Will, uh, it works <laughs> great for me. I mean, I don't get, uh, yeah, I get bombarded with stuff. So yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. I don't get the car warranty calls, but Will does. Well, I just refinanced my house and I get so many of these, like, mm-hmm. hey, VA types, VA stuff, uh, financing stuff now. It's just, I'm like, it's kind of ridiculous yeah. how much you get because that is public information. Like you're saying, it's your PAI and it's out there for everybody and they just bombard you. I mean, I'm, I get two or three letters a week about refinancing my house. I'm like, I just did it. I don't want to, you know, whatever. So, yeah. what is a, what's a good way to kind of, uh, what is some other good steps you can take to uh, prevent cyber attacks for your information, Cliff? Yeah. So, just to set the precedence and like, you know, give a foundation and set expectations, I guess you can't remove anything that's already on the internet. That's out there like multiple times, right? You can do your best to kind of remove some old information, but it's really how you move forward with new information to make it better for you. Right. So like, <clears throat> you know, obviously listen to that podcast and his book and stuff, Michael Bazzelli has got some really good stuff, but really it's just kind of like common sense. Be careful with the information try to get off the internet as much as you can. So I'm talking like social media, anything like that. Uh, Gmail, Google, they pretty much take all your information, Amazon, Facebook, all those big companies, any information that you use within public is going to get out there. Right. So like, I don't know if you guys know, but like any email you have from Gmail, every single email is scanned and read by Google. And that information no, that. potentially get out there. Yeah. And, and you know, it's in there to say when you sign up for the account, it's in that fine print and stuff in there. Uh, you know, yeah, nobody that. ever reads that. And that's just like yeah. the Apple updates or you're like, whatever, click. Exactly. Like, I don't know. Did you guys ever think it's weird? Is like when you install an app, it says, you know, we need access to every single piece of information on your cell phone. Yeah. Why is that? Right. It's because we are just taking convenience over security and we don't care about that anymore. Right. Well, so there, there are some idea. apps that like, yeah. There are yeah. some apps that I won't accept if they want certain things. I was like, nope, I don't exactly. need this. So, yeah. And that's Sorry. how it gets out there, though. Yeah. So, that's how the information is there. You know, geo tracking, that's another one. Like, every single app wants to geo track where mm-hmm. you are. <clears throat> you know, unless I'm using a map, my geo tracking on my phone is always shut off. Yep, mine too. Good. So, but, uh, like, how do you find out what's out there about you? I mean, is there a way you can kind of say, if, if you want to, hey, what is out there on me? Is, what, what do you do there? So, obviously the easiest way is just to Google you. And if you can find it on Google quickly, that's how easy it is to get there. And if you wanted to do some, you know, research and then also try to get some of that information off, start with that stuff first. That's going to be the easiest found. You know, when we talk about like the hacker community and the security community, it's all about the low hanging fruit, which is the stuff that's easy to access and easy to get information about. A quick Google, social media, things like that. That's going to be the first thing grab and the easiest stuff to get. Yeah. So another thing, I mean, you keep talking about open source intelligence techniques by Michael Basil right here at seventh edition. He's constantly updating his book because again, uh, like Cliff's saying, you know, information is constantly changing. Uh, I think this is his latest uh, is a seventh edition uh, that's out there. There could be an eighth edition now. 
Um, but that's a great, I mean, if you're, if you're concerned about yourself and how to find yourself and the safe way of doing it and removing that information, um, yeah. I highly recommend that book. Yeah. And, and Jake, hold that back up again. So I want you to make you guys understand how hard this is. It's not easy to look how thick this book is. Like it is not easy to get rid of a lot of your information on there. Yeah. They're making it harder and harder today because people want your information. Obviously we just talked about it. Like everyone wants your information and they're going to do what they can to sell that information and make money off of you. Yeah, so, so like, like 563 pages. Yeah, there you go. And that's not the index. So that's what you're talking about. Like when um, I think we're going to talk about this la later on, but we're talking, you know, when you look Google like a new trucker or whatever you want to buy, and then all of a sudden you get ads everywhere and all your social media stuff. That's how those cookies and all that Snoop software or whatever it is that follows you around, right? Mm -hmm. The trackers, we talked about it last week, mm -hmm. those trackers that are on your emails and your. Uh, websites that you go to and that's how they get a lot of that information gotcha. all right so um legal requests can you legally ask certain companies to remove your information or how do you do go about that i don't know the fine details behind it but okay. essentially if it's public information you can request for it to be taken down especially if you have a good reason for it yeah um, and then they are required by law to remove it if you have legal reason for it and then you can you know potentially open up a lawsuit or whatever it is if they don't follow through on that and that's the biggest thing to do is they also have a ton of websites um, that'll help you do this. Um, I don't have any of the names off the top of my head, but several websites out there. They'll go through all your online accounts, all your information that they can find on the interweb, and they'll help you, you know, pretty much make requests to get that information removed. Yeah, I know. So when I was a active police officer, a lot of the times, if you had any of those white pages, look up type websites, you could just email them, say, hey, you know, I don't want my information out there. Say I'm law enforcement. They take it right off and you wouldn't get on there anymore so i don't know if it's as easy as that anymore it may have changed so a lot so, of just like realize. spokio's easy to find yeah the white pages i mean i we use spokio a lot um and i can find a lot you know court documents a lot of people don't realize court documents right speeding tickets uh, yeah. that's all mm -hmm. that's all out there I can, public yep yeah so um you, you really it's hard these days to hide i think a great example of hiding yourself um you know, all of us were in the military one time, Bin Laden. UBL was so hard to find because he went completely off mm -hmm. the grid. If it wasn't for a courier with a cell phone, yep. the, the dude still may be alive today. Mm -hmm. Unless you're a conspiracy theorist like Will who still thinks he's alive. I don't you know, think he's alive. I just think you know, that I think that he was giving up all of his other networks to stay alive a little bit longer before we uh, decided to do what we did. But, uh, you know, you, you almost have to be – I've always said, man, like – like if I was wanted for some major crime, if I committed a major crime, that like literally would, everything's gone. Like yeah. mm -hmm. no ATM card, no cell phone, nothing. Yeah. You have like, to. You, you got to cut ties with everyone and everything. Yeah. So you kind of uh, talked earlier about uh, doing digital statements and stuff like, like that. What about online banking? Is that like, is that, I know I do online banking because I use the USAA. And so obviously there's no brick and mortar around where I live. So. Yeah, it's, I mean, you have to use online banking, essentially. It's, this is where people are taking convenience over security, right? Especially in their digital age. But it's kind of what we talked about before. You're always going to enable MFA, right? Use those strong and complex passwords. Um, don't use public Wi-Fi if it's not available. Like just, or always use a VPN as well, right? Mm -hmm. Any information that goes to those Wi-Fis, you know, could potentially be taken. And, and, you know, some of that is PAI and PII, right? So you don't want your passwords and your banking information, social security, all that stuff to get out there. So it's kind of like, you know, just use that common sense and just be as secure as you can, especially when you have to use mobile banking. So, so I know like mine, I always use my phone and I has biometrics and a uh, multi-factor. I mean, and I have to put a code in it. So it's got like three different levels. I got to put my pen, put my face and put my code in. So that's good. I think. Cliff it to two really important parts with, you know, when we talk just not just banking, but any any type of accounts that has your PII on there. And your PAI is also tied in with that. But look, if you're traveling, I tell this all to my you know, business clients and stuff. When you're traveling, I don't care if it's here in the US, over in China, Europe, Eastern Europe, don't check your accounts over yeah. there. I mean, you can have a VPN, you can do multi-factor authentication. And those are good tools to have. But my rule of thumb is I don't check my stuff unless I'm not at home. That's you know, good. It's just, it, there's no need to. Um, 
maybe if I'm out in California, I'm at my parents' house and I'm on their internet because um, I set up their router and everything. But I really, it, unless you're at home on your own internet, don't check it. Um, Cliff, one thing I did want to ask too, you know, what's the difference between, do you think it's more secure using a banking app or an application to sign into your accounts or going directly to the website? That's a tough one. Um, going into the bank is the answer. So. And that's not always possible. It's not always possible. Hey, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a cyber that's side. Is there a difference, I guess, beside, uh, between um, using the, the bank website or using the bank's application? Is one more secure over the other? The answer is probably yes, right? But we probably don't know. We don't have information on how those websites are built or how those applications are built. Okay. We don't know exactly which security is going there. We have to take them for their word. And, you know, they have to meet certain standards for, you know, important information and, and our personal information. But we really don't know what their standards are internally. I think 60 Minutes did a great episode years ago regarding online banking. And again, I mean, this was probably five plus years ago about the hazards of it. And kind of what I took away was like, holy crap, I, I want to get off online banking. And then I realized, again, like convenience over security. Uh, I've chosen convenience, but I've also chosen, okay, doing exactly what Cliff said, use a VPN, multi-factor authentication, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, man, we're, every time, Will, we, we have a podcast on security, like hard, like diving deep into it, it always kind of puts a dark, kind of like the weather outside right now. Yeah. Here in North Carolina, man, it's like, it's about like to snow. I'm feeling it's like about I'm to snow here. We shouldn't complain because everyone in the Midwest, Texas, I talked to all my buddies, you know, they don't have power. It's 17, if not below. And uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're hurting there. But uh, it's like a big dark cloud sometimes <laughs> when we talk security. And it's it's not that bad, I want to tell people. Like, do everything you can. Um, threats are always going to be there. You can't prevent everything from happening. Um, but you can protect yourself and not make yourself an easy target. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing, what you just said, is not making yourself the easy target. Yeah, because, I mean, most crimes are crimes of opportunity. So I imagine cyber is the same way. They're going to have these little programs that pick off the low-hanging fruit, and that's good enough unless they're specifically targeting you. Exactly. I think the low-hanging fruit are the ones that are going to get picked, not if you're you know six mm -hmm. feet up or whatever, 10 feet up. All right, so let's move on to USBs and other external devices. What kind of things do you have to be aware of for that? Yeah, so, you know, people call them USB condoms, or they're really just USB data blockers, right? And it's preventing people taking their information. I'm sure you guys remember uh, like credit card skimmers, you know, they're still being used sometimes, but it's essentially Gas the same thing all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially we want to stop that the same thing for USB. So like my biggest thought is, is like when you go to an airport and you're sitting there waiting at your gate and they have that little USB right there to plug your phone in, that's the biggest thing you could go in there and plant a device if you can get away with it. And you know how many people plug their phones in there, you know, it's, no. Yeah, so just things I, like that. I carry an external charger with me. I don't. I don't ever use an app and a little charger pack, battery pack that I carry. I don't ever charge at an unknown. What about on an airplane? You know, we're talking about airports. What about on an airplane? Same thing, right? Yeah, I would. If you're ever going to put a USB into a block or you know a wall out or anything like that, you always try to use a data blocker, especially if you don't have your own block. I think that's a really really good information. I mean, you see almost everyone. Yeah, I see on planes plugging their stuff in, charging their phones. Mm -hmm. You know, um, maybe instead of using your USB cable to charge your iPhone or Samsung, whatever the phone you're using, just bring. You know, I know a lot of planes these days, and uh, I mean, I used to travel a ton. Just plug it in. Most planes have an outlet, so yeah, exactly. an outlet over over the USB. Um, I'm glad. I think that's a great point. I don't think a lot of people realize mm -hmm. the dangers of a USB port. Uh, a public USB port. Exactly. So what does a US data blocker do? You know, can you essentially, you know, it's like when you plug it into your, your computer and it says, do you want your phone to access this or anything like that? Access the photos and the information, you know, it's a lot of times it's the same thing as like, you know, when the military doesn't allow uh, USB sticks to be used anymore. Right. Essentially what you can do is you can create, programs in there to automatically enable and run programs when something's plugged in, you know, like the autoplay features, like when you plug a CD into a computer, you can make it where it automatically plays, right. To make it convenient for you. People can do the same thing for that. So, you know, it could also just start a program on your phone and start taking your information 
uh, go into your files in there and see what's on there and just start copying it or using it or whatever it is. Okay. Okay. So what about like uh, eavesdropping concerns? What are some things you should be aware of and how can you help prevent it? So when I think of that, I think about, you know, like Wi-Fi is probably the biggest one that's easy to eavesdrop. Uh, we go to an airport, just continue with the scenario, right? Oh, hey, look at this free internet. I'm going to go jump on that free Wi-Fi, right? Um, just be careful about what you're using for any kind of internet, signals, Bluetooth, anything like that. Make sure you know what you're connecting to. That's the first biggest thing you can do, right? Um, know what applications you're using. We talked about Gmail before. How about they read a lot of your emails and they can take that information. You know, I use a couple of different email applications to get away with that. Um, and back to the Wi-Fi, I don't think people realize how easy it is to like create a Wi-Fi signal and have people to connect to that. And then you can connect to another one. So it looks like they're getting Wi-Fi, but all the information you put goes through them. You know, it kind of goes back to using VPNs and using encryption when you can. And, you know, if you can, don't even go on any kind of public Wi-Fi as possible. Yeah. I mean, most of the, you know, the smartphone, right? Like, um, I just learned I was trying to do, uh, I was restarting the computer. I was having lunch with someone, help restart the computer. And um, Verizon now, you have to pay extra for a hotspot, whereas before you didn't. Um, and again, I think that all changed over the last year. Uh, I used to travel a lot. So whenever I was in the airport um, and traveling, I, even in a hotel, I wouldn't link up to the hotel mm -hmm. Wi-Fi. I just used my phone. As a hotspot, you can buy little pucks too, um, mm -hmm. internet Wi-Fi pucks. So those are good solutions, right? We're talking about all this, like kind of, you know, scary these threats out there, but there's there are solutions for them, you know. Um, so it just costs money. <laughs> it does. But, yeah. Um, I mean, again, that's why they do. It. Yeah. So it, it's security. Um, but what is your information worth to you? You know. Yep. So. Yeah, I, I was dealing with a financial hack. I mean, I uh, my card years ago got at a gas station right down the road from my house. You know, someone used a skimmer on there. And luckily, my wife always checks the bank account all the time, probably checking up on me. Um, but uh, she noticed it, right? Um, a bunch of um, computer parts. And everyone who knows me knows, like, I'm not buying computer video games or any of <laughs> that garbage. So um, that was an easy one. But they, you know, they tried to drain nearly $1,200 worth. Luckily, there was like a two-day hold. Yeah. Um, so called the bank, and uh, they took care of it, you know. Best Buy, you know, that was another example last year, you know, someone out in Washington bought like six sets of uh, the new iPod earbuds. Um, how they got that, I don't know. Um, I, you know, I probably, I think this goes into another thing too. Uh, Best Buy card account years and years ago, never, you know, I, I think I probably mm -hmm. used it once to buy a TV, shut it down, you know, to get the 20% off or whatever, but I never shut it down you know, closed mm -hmm. it out. So again, if you're, if you have credit cards or any kind of card statement where people can use it and you're not using it, shut that thing down uh, as fast as possible and check your credit report. You get um, a free one every single year. Um, I know most banks offer like a credit or credit monitoring system and they'll give you some kind of alert. So well, I know yeah. my bank, if I travel outside of the, like a certain mileage and I start using my, my card, it'll alert me. It'll like, put a freeze on it and they'll call me and say, Hey, are you using this? Are you traveling? Cause if I, yeah, they give the option to let you know, let them know they're traveling. But if you don't let them know, they'll freeze it until you confirm yeah. that you are the one who's actually using it. So. Yep. And that's a great point. So we talked about convenience and security, right? If you can on your bank accounts and your cards put on that most strict uh, rule and policy that you can, it sucks sometimes having to let them know every time you go travel. Right. And on the other side, like you mentioned before, get some of those credit and identity monitoring tools they have out there. I use one, uh, lets me know every single account that's been added to my identity. Um, it does free dark web searches, uh, checks your information for PAI, MPAI that's been released. It can be beneficial to have some of those services. I know, I know it's probably been more difficult to track them now with so much online shopping being done. So I, they have to watch where they're being shipped to, and I don't know if they have that access or not. So I use American Express, right? I don't use my checking bank card for any online purchase. I always use a credit card. I'm an American Express fan, mainly because of the points for traveling and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and every time my American Express card is used, I get an alert on my phone. And I think, you know, set up those alerts every time it's used. It may be annoying if you use your credit card a lot, like I do when I travel, but it, it's worth it because if something comes up, yeah. I'll call my wife like, hey, did you swipe the credit card? Oh yeah, I'm like, okay, gotcha. 
Uh, she doesn't send to me, but uh, yeah, uh, privacy screens. You know, we're, mm -hmm. let's continue on this topic of traveling in the airport and all these little things, right? Um, I can't tell you how many people uh, I'm guilty of it sometimes. Like, huh, what's that dude watching? You know, uh, looks mm -hmm. interesting, right? Um, so everyone's a little nosy. I think that's just kind of inherent, or maybe I'm just nosy and a weirdo. But uh, a good privacy screen for your computer. Uh, I, I think that's that's a must, especially for traveling. Uh, and you're doing work stuff. I can't, you know, there's numerous times. I mean, when I travel a lot, it's for work and I'm doing work stuff on my work computer. So uh, I think privacy screens, especially if you are working for yeah. a company, you know, talk to your company, talk to their chief security officer or just yourself, man. Go out and buy a privacy screen. They run, I don't know, you get Gee. what you pay for. You know, yeah. you get what you pay for too uh, on some of these, but, you know, you can get them for 20 bucks on Amazon, you know, up to, you know, $100. So, um, uh, read the reviews, see it, you know, maybe buy both, you know, and see, mm -hmm. hold it up to your computer, see if you can see it. And like, oh, you know, this one's garbage. Let me return it and, and keep the one that's a little bit more money. And yeah. like we said before, like when people are looking for stuff, they're going for the low hanging fruit. If they see a person with the privacy screen, they're just going to go right to the next person if they're trying to do something easy, you know, unless you're being targeted individually, it could save you. Yeah. So I know we've talked a lot about email last weekend. We're touching a little bit on this week. So what are, can you just give a couple of tips of those? Cause emails kind of, I think is the biggest phishing campaigns happen. And I think that's mm -hmm. where people are the most vulnerable. Cause I mean, mm -hmm. unless you have the security in place, it's real easy to get fooled by some of them. So. Yeah. And we were just talking about it, you know, internally at their company where I think one of us, or we got a study that pretty much said, you know, the biggest credential theft is still coming from phishing emails. I think there's something like 80% mm -hmm. of credential theft is still coming from a phishing email. And, you know, that's enterprise wide, but if it's enterprise wide, it's going to be worldwide for personal stuff too. Um, just use common sense with emails. Uh, be careful what kind of email applications you're using. We talked about Gmail. You know, I use some other applications like look into like Proton Mail and see what's different about them and, and why they're, you know, more desirable for hiding information and stuff like that. So, so Cliff, so I have both. I have a Gmail and a Proton mm -hmm. email account. Um, do you have what I would call like an average Joe, like a Yahoo, a Gmail uh, account, and then do you have a Proton mail, email, and then how do you use the two, and, and why is it good to kind of separate it? Yeah, and so, you know, I have all the emails, right? Um, I try not to use my Gmail at all. I, I don't really want anything going through Gmail, right? I do use, you know, Outlook and Live Hotmail type of mail for my personal use. Uh, and then anything that I want important, uh, privacy, anything like that, I will use my Proton mail. Anything that I want to be, I don't want to say anonymous, but the closest thing to anonymous that I can get. Uh, and, you know, not sharing information, I'll use Proton mail. Essentially, people use Proton mail for daily things all the time. And it's possible. Uh, you just got to be careful about what you're using. Is that a free or is it a paid service? Proton has at least a free level of service and, okay. you know, to get the job done for what you need. Yeah, I mean, okay. So um, <clears throat> when you do click, when you do see something like, I know I get stuff all the time from different, it looks like Amazon or, or LinkedIn or whatever. How can you, what are some like tips that you can give to, Hey, don't click on it. You know, that's probably a phishing campaign. Don't click on anything. Man. <laughs> if it's important, it'll say, Hey, go onto our website. Here's the steps on our website to access this information. Go verify it here. Go check this here. You know, a lot of companies with legitimate emails will include links, but most of them should also include how to not access that link. And also, yep. like if it says, you know, here, call our phone number right here. Don't call that number. Go verify that the number is correct online on their website and things like that. Same I'm thing laughing, with but I know it's true. You know, like I've had buddies <laughs> literally call and they're like, but they sounded so legitimate. I'm like, yeah. You know, like, no crap. Of course yeah. it did. You mm -hmm. know, um, they got you, man. Um, they hooked you. I yeah. mean, there's some that you look at, you're like, come on, man, this is ridiculous. How does yeah. anybody fall? And then there's others. You're like, this is really good. And like tracking, I know a lot, like I'll get some, Hey, track your order on Amazon. I was like, that doesn't look right. Like the other ones. So, you know, but tracking yeah. numbers too, that's something you can always copy down and then go to the FedEx or whatever the service are using. Don't click on that link either. Yeah, and like you said, people are getting really good at this. Uh, fake websites, fake email addresses, make sure if you have to use the link for some odd reason, you know, hover over it, copy and paste the link, see what the link actually goes to, right? Make sure that link doesn't change over time. You know, people can get smart emails uh, with like forwarding addresses, right? You click, 
maybe this is gogl.com on the link, right? And it sends you to Google for the first 10 minutes, but after midnight, it sends you to you've been hacked.com or whatever it is like that. Yeah. You know, make sure you're verifying that information. Also and look at, you know, listen. HTTP versus HTTPS, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that's another easy one, easy spot. And I'm not saying just because it says HTTPS in the beginning that it's a secure site, uh, but it's definitely much more secure than just an HTTP. So um, Jake likes the hover method over the link. I like to go to see who the sender was because a lot of times the senders will be so and so for at XYZ 2373. You got hacked or whatever, you know. You're just like that's not a legitimate email address, so that's exactly. that's another way I like to kind of check up on it. <clears throat> I always like to like my favorite is the Nigerian Prince. Um, I think I've donated a lot to him, so I think he's <laughs> a king now. Uh, I'm just waiting for my royalty check. He said it's coming any day, um, so you know, fingers crossed. Yeah, I mean, why not? He has access to my bank account. It's only been drained like 15 times every single month. I get paid, but no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> So we're talking about how, you know, what if you do get hacked, how often should you like uh, back up your stuff? So if you do get hacked, you can kind of start over and, and redo everything. Yeah. So they make this fairly easy sometimes. Right. So, you know, OneDrive, you know, Google Drive, Dropbox, all those applications for, you know, cloud, which is a whole other issue at, in hand. But the cloud providers, you know, they can do it automatic for you. I know like for OneDrive has, you know, ransomware prevention with their backups automatic. If you have it hooked to your computer, it'll back it up, you know, weekly for you. And then if you get ransomware, boom, just restore it. That's the same method that they use in enterprise networks and enterprise data, you know, weekly backups, make that backup not accessible to a, you know, a mischievous person, an adversary as well. Um, just make sure that you have access to it and can back it up if it happens. When you say enterprise, can you explain that? So I'm talking about, you know, we have, you know, Joe's global gym.com and they have all their information uh, that they have for the gym, PAI, you know, credit card information, whatever it is, um, they're going to have a backup and maybe they have like an offsite tape backup. So they do weekly backups and they take a physical tape and they put it in a safe or something like that. So people can't access it. So if, you know, some bad person got onto their network, they could potentially go encrypt, you know, ransomware, their backup folder as well, you know, just making it, um, another layer of security and protection, uh, for their information and their data in case it is you know, have ransomware and encrypted. I think that's an important part of security that a lot of people don't realize, whether it's physical or cyber, but the recovery process, you mm -hmm. know, um, we talk that threats are always out there. Um, you can do your best, um, but sometimes bad stuff just happens. Um, yeah. And so I think a great plan, whether it's personal or professional, is that recovery plan um, and actually having like an actual plan for it. You know, hey, if this happens, you know, um, I think I, I always think of Sony Pictures Entertainment when they got hacked uh, years ago, um, yeah. supposedly by North Korea. The interview. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, all you know, um, but, you know, North Korea for a year plus, uh, the data shown had already infiltrated their system. It was just mm -hmm. when to strike. Um, exactly. But they didn't have a recovery plan. I mean, for months. You know, people weren't allowed to use emails. I mean, their whole system shut down. Yeah. So having a recovery plan, and they've learned uh, from this, but having a recovery plan, a lot of companies learn from that that incident and that event, and some haven't, and some just don't realize it. But having a good recovery plan, whether it's personal or professional, um, if something, you know, if you're hacked or a bad event happens to you, um, is always a, a good thing to do. And to add to that, do a dry run on it. Make sure that you can the plan works. <laughs> it's a lot of people <laughs> don't do that, and it you know, yeah. comes back. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I mean, uh, I think in our military career, you know, we talked about always talked about evacuations and hey, if we had, you know, we called them a blowout plan. Uh, we'd create these awesome plans. And I was the intel guy on the team. And you, know, you spend weeks and weeks creating these plans for whatever country you're in and how you're going to get out, you know, and you, you know, airplane or air land, see how are you going to do it, you know, in walking. Um, and rarely did we. Um, test those plans so how effective were those plans if something really were to happen um mm -hmm. so test your plan or your plan how, how secure are those like uh cloud-based backups and stuff like that or is somebody monitoring them or can they see your information because i know i like to back my stuff up on an external hard drive a lot so external is definitely the way to go right something that you have full control of is good and bad. You completely control it, right? But when it comes to that, you cannot take any convenience over that. 
that's 100% on you for your security, right? Okay. Good thing about some of these cloud providers is there's a standard that they set as well. So like, let's talk about, you know, Microsoft and, you know, Amazon, a lot of these cloud providers, they're doing what they can to be the most competitive in their environment with way more eyes and money put into these resources than, you know, a small company can do, right? So the good thing is that they are putting a lot of resources and money into the security for these. Um, so that is a good thing. Obviously, it's not always in your hands, but sometimes to a scale, it is better, um, especially if you're not going to put in the security for a personal external device that you need to. Yeah. Wasn't uh, Amazon, AWS, and Microsoft Cloud, was it two years ago that they were bidding on the DoD contract for their cloud service? Um, I think right. Microsoft won. Um, still, I think, getting held up in court right now by Amazon. Uh, but I, my, that's not my point. My point of, of that is, the technology that they put into their cloud services, right? For the DOD, I think, and I'm not sure on this and maybe you can answer, you know, but all that technology and all that security <laughs> that the DOD required mm -hmm. for, you know, I think being in the DOD, you see a lot of stuff that starts with the DOD and it trickles down to the civilian population. And so I'm wondering if those two cloud service providers, um, I've almost set the standard at that time for cloud security. Um, and it's, I, you know, as I'm sure it's slowly trickling down in the civilian populace as they see it. Yeah. And it, it's a great thing that I think Amazon and I think Amazon is the largest cloud provider. And I think Microsoft's behind them at number two. And the good thing is that they really are battling each other, you know, with ISO, NIST, all these standards, um, not the basics, right? They want to be the most secure. So they're going above and beyond to make sure that their stuff is secure uh, to for customers and enterprise and individuals, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, when it comes down to it, it is more expensive, but you know, they're offering capabilities that a lot of people can't provide in their mom and pop, small shop and small businesses. Yeah. So Cliff, I mean, you talked about Gmail. Uh, I know a lot of people that use Gmail. I'm one of them, right? And so, and probably Yahoo, but what are some alternative, uh, you, you briefly talked about like Proton Mail, um, but for people who right now are like, uh-oh, I'm screwed. Um, because I, I'm, I am a Gmail user, right? I, I use it all the time. And I know a lot of small companies that use it as their um, company email address. So what do you recommend for them to, to make that transition over and you know, other alternative email providers, like specifically? And not that you're endorsing them or that the Coffee mm -hmm. Squad is endorsing them at all. You know, it's just uh, another avenue of something to think about. Yeah. So, you know, first of all, I encourage you to go do research, everybody, to see really what your email provider says that they will do with your information. Right. Um, and honestly, don't use email if you you don't have to. Uh, we talked previously, I think, about like signal, signal and encryption message providers. Use some of those things or if you can without using email, something that's going to be a little bit more secure and encrypted. And if you have to use email. You know, use those ones we talked about in the previous podcast, 10 minute mail, all that kind of stuff. That's going to be temporary email. So you're not giving your information out there. And if you have to use some of those proton mails, you can look up like PGP uh, way for email, things like that. Um, I don't have a ton of them off the top of my head because I use proton mail personally. But go look at those ones that don't share any information. Okay. That's awesome. That's, uh, you know, I think that's. We've talked a lot of uh, a ton of good information, whether it's traveling yep. and then like your personal uh, email account. So hopefully for our listeners out there, like, oh, um, it hits something today. Of like, let me look into that and let me find a solution that works for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as we start to wrap up, here's here's the most important question, I think. Right. How do you balance convenience with security? <laughs> How do I balance it personally? <laughs> I mean, what would you, how would you tell somebody if you were advising them, say, hey, this is how you kind of have to do it? That's tough because our society is way more convenient than secure right now. But it's going to be difficult to be able to do that. And it's kind of just think about you have to always start. We talk about the enterprise level. You start from a secure level and you work your way down. Right. And that's how you have to start personally as well. So. If you have to type your information in or sign up for anything right there, you're automatically going to convenience and you're giving up some of your security. It's kind of hard to explain how to even start this, but it's just on the physical side, on, so, on the physical side, all, this is, I mean, we talk about this all the time with our clients, right? So um, again, you start what's your asset, you know, 
Uh, and you have primary assets and you have secondary assets. Uh, so how do you want to protect those assets? What are the risks, threats, and vulnerabilities to each of mm-hmm. those assets? And then if you look at yourself, identify those assets for yourself and what are risks, threats, and vulnerabilities. When you use convenience, that's a vulnerability, right? Mm-hmm. And a threat. It can be both at times. But um, so what are you willing to sacrifice? If you're willing to sacrifice your bank account, okay. You know, are there backups? You know, what's, what's your backup plan that we've talked about? What's your recovery plan? Um, so on the physical side, I don't know if that's kind of the same on the, on the cyber side, uh, Cliff, but um, that's how we always kind of approach that question. And it, it is very much the same. Yeah. So what about if you go completely like Internet of Things? Is there something like I, I know that's like super convenient, right? You just walk in. Hey, uh, whoever, smart home, turn on my thermostat, smart home, turn the TV off, you know, all that stuff. It, it's it, as long as you're network secure, are you pretty safe or is that something you really have to weigh? It, and obviously, the most secure thing is to not use it. Right. Yeah. Um, and then it's going to go down to device security and network security. Uh, network segmentation of where that IoT stuff is, a lot of that's going to go down into it. They're pretty much to have a safe smart home and use IoT, it takes a lot to to really be super secure. And don't give the password out to your best friend who knows every single one like Tim does. You know, like <laughs> now he's going to blackmail me on the internet. Thanks, Tim. So how do you? Uh, so as we're wrapping up, how do you secure your private information? What are some things you can do to kind of do that? You know, it's it's hard to secure uh, a lot of private information and just don't let it be out there. And if you do have it, uh, try not to put it in the cloud. If it's going to be digital, you know, if it's going to be physical, keep it locked up, make sure nobody has access to it. Uh, and the biggest thing is just don't even have it out there. Right. Except stuff that you're required to have. Keep a hard copy of it. Put it in a safe, put it in a lockbox, mm-hmm. put it under, you know, a lockbox under an LLC or a trust where it's not associated with your name, you know, something like that. I know one thing I do for my address uh, is I have a PO box that I use. So if I use that when I'm allowed, when I'm able to, I use my PO box. So Mm -hmm. my home address isn't out there as often as it would Mm -hmm. be if that's the only address I use. Yeah. Go buy a house under a trust or an LLC. Don't have your name associated with it. Use a PO box, use information that doesn't come back to you. We're allowed. I think different States have different laws. So. I'm not sure how that all boils down. So. Yeah, Florida has a huge law. I know a lot of wealthy people buy second homes and third homes in Florida because of bankruptcy type laws um, and other laws where um, certain things can't be asset forfeiture laws that they have there. But yeah, right. awesome, Cliff. I just uh, I really appreciate everything you've done to help this out and and a lot of good information out there. I, I think over the last two weeks we've. We've covered a lot of good cybersecurity type information for the home person who's kind of just learning on this stuff. So I really appreciate everything. I know. So just one other thing too with with Cliff and what he's doing. So we talk a lot. You know, this this podcast is about forty five minutes long. We do try to shorten them uh, because we know, like, hey, most people want twenty to thirty minutes. But sometimes there's a lot of information, and we talk fast and we talk about a lot of stuff. What Cliff's doing for us as well is he's created some little web series for us. Um, uh, they're still in the works. They should be coming out here in a few weeks. Um, but that's kind of, I would say, some of the more basic stuff with some PowerPoints to, to kind of reiterate what we've talked about. Or if you kind of got lost in the podcast, uh, to go back and, and look at. So um, Cliff's been a huge asset for us. We we appreciate it. Um, hopefully our, our listeners get stuff out of this as well. Um, and if, again, if it was too fast or you don't fully understand, uh, watch out for those web series. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about as we close out where you can find those at. All right. Yeah. So uh, Cliff, again, thank you. Don't forget to check us out on YouTube channel. Uh, Just go to youtube.com, search coffee squad podcast, you know, subscribe, give us comments. We always appreciate uh, whatever you can talk about, like Tim giving up Jake's uh, email and passwords and all that stuff. That's, that's great information for us. (laughs) Go to uh, coffee squad podcast.com and you can listen to everything. uh, Listen to us. It has all of the links to your favorite pot or your favorite platforms stuff like that we just got listed on pandora finally so you can find us on pandora now uh, follow us on facebook all that good stuff uh cliff will be his series should be coming out in the next few weeks or so and that will be at our freedom consulting page fc-llc.org awesome thanks cliff appreciate it thanks guys all right have a good one <laughs>